Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're really glad that you've joined us. We're here to talk about plants and bugs and insects and anything that comes up, and we really gear it to what's going on right now. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department, College of Aces. But, and so I will talk about landscaping things as well as cut flowers, but I have some really great panelists here who know all kinds of stuff. I mean, horticultural information. <laughs> Let's find out who's here and they'll tell you a little bit about their expertise. And so direct your questions in that way, if you will. Let's start first with Jim Schuster. Hi, Jim. Hi, <clears throat> I'm a retired extension plant pathologist. And I would like to talk about how to plant a, a stake a tree that's been just planted because a lot of people end up killing them when they're staking them. If you're using one stake, it goes to the southwest, two stakes east and west, three stakes northwest, southwest, and directly east, and if it's four stakes, do the uh, northeast, southeast, the southwest and that. And you need to leave some slack in the uh, rope. Uh, if you're tying the tree at roughly four to six feet, you should have at least three inches of slack between the tree and the stake so that the whole trunk can wiggle from the ground up. If you tie them too tight, all the bending is at the tie mark and you're prone to having a problem. And you should only have it tied one year. If you have to tie it for a second year, you should change the height of the tying mark. And you need to use something that will rot. Do not use things like nylon rope, clothesline with plastic, wire, or garden hose. Uh, and, and like I say, if you don't remember to take it off, the trees will try and eat them. And if the wind's strong enough, it'll stamp the tree off at the tie mark. Wow, you have some really interesting specimens there about <laughs> what not to do. Right. Oh boy, thank you, Jim. You have probably the best show and tells. <laughs> you just have a whole... Oh, I got a closet full. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, you must have categorize, here's how right. to kill a tree. <laughs> thank you, Jim, very much. Well, we're happy to have Candace Miller mm -hmm. on the show. Welcome, Candace. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Uh, my name is Candace Miller. I am a horticulture educator with U of I Extension, and I actually serve six counties in the northwestern corner. Uh, if you want to know the counties, it's uh, Joe Davis, Stevenson, Winnebago, and then Boone, DeKalb, and Ogle. So um, as a hort educator, I get a variety of questions. Um, I'll probably take more of the kind of ornamental, landscape, vegetable gardening type of questions today. Excellent. Right. Okay, um, I have an email to start out with first. Um, this uh, emailer is asking, can you identify this bush with little white uh, berries? And it's a, it's a very nice uh, shot that they sent. And this is actually bayberry or northern bayberry is another common name, uh, Miracle Pennsylvanica. Uh, and this is a pretty adaptable shrub, pretty easy to grow. Um, D Dan was just mentioning hers is rather large and could use some pruning, but the one in the photo looks like it's already been pruned to a little bit of a smaller size. Um, one interesting thing about bayberry is that it does have separate male and female plants. So if you do want to get the nice uh, white gray uh, berries on there, you do need to plant both male and female plants so that you can have that fruit produce. But otherwise, really nice foliage, pretty adaptable, uh, pretty easy shrub to grow. I was not even trying to do that. I evidently <laughs> have enough bayberry plants Heck that it's yeah. worked out. I guess so. Gosh, you learn something every day. <laughs> Thank you, Candace, yeah. so much. And now, let's go to the bug guy. I mean, <laughs> the person next to me, Dr. Phil Nixon. Hi, Phil. Hello. <laughs> I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist at the University of Illinois. So I do bugs, as uh, <laughs> Diane mentioned. I also will bug you if you bother me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, we have a video, and then we're going to talk about jumping plant gall, uh, jumping oak gall, I should say. And jumping oak gall is, uh, galls are formed by actually plant material. Uh, the insects start feeding on them, and the gall will form around them. And the jumping oak gall will, pr will produce little pinhead-sized uh, uh, lumps on leaves of, of oak trees. <clears throat> about this time of year, you can see them. And they will, uh, they will produce, uh, uh, they'll be kind of whitish or they may cause the whole leaf to turn a little reddish. Uh, but an interesting thing is as they go to mature, they will drop off of the plant, off of the leaves and fall to the ground. And the larvae inside will, can, will flex their body 
and make the uh, little galls jump. And if they're on a hard surface, they can jump up in the air, oh, a half an inch or so, not a whole lot. I remember early when in my career, I had somebody bring some in, they were in a paper sack and they were sitting over in the corner and I kept hearing, the, it sounded like I had a mouse in the sack jumping around. <laughs> uh, but uh, they don't really hurt the tree a whole lot. Uh, plants with, with galls will grow about as well as those that do not. Uh, this is nice because they're almost impossible to prevent. But uh, we're gonna run through the video and you can see the, uh, the, the little parts that will fall off a leaf onto the ground and they kind of jump around. It's kind of neat to look at. So they're kind of kind of neat. It's one of those little interesting parts of nature that we have. Uh, again, don't get all bent out of shape about them. <laughs> and if you see things jumping around on your on your patio and they're and they're spherical and kind of whitish, they're not fleas. They're probably jumping oak galls. That was a pretty mm -hmm. interesting video. I guess I have not noticed those mm -hmm. before. Do they occur on every oak, or in just certain varieties? Uh, they're mainly on white oak group uh, oaks, uh -huh. and uh, and I see them most commonly on white oak itself. Interesting. Okay. Well, cool. thank you, viewer and Phil. All right, we're going to go to the phone lines next. Let's start with line one, and Joe has a question about Cleveland pears. Hi there, Joe. Hi, Diane. Hey, uh, I was wanting to know if any tree expert there I don't see. <laughs> but anyway, if you can answer a question, the Cleveland pears have got some dead leaves on them three or four inches and then the new growth comes out the end and i was wanting to know if you had a solution to the problem are Fireball. just the leaves turning brown or is the stem also turning brown it turns brown and the stem turns brown it dies you yeah. can break it off and to you, the green you, and new will come out yeah you have fire blight fire blight yeah and it's a bacterial disease uh, generally enters through the flowers and, grow, and then uh, leaves the flower and comes down the branch a common uh, symptom is the um, browning and hooking of that twig. So it should look like a shepherd's crook. That does not always happen. It only does that about 90% of the time. The control is when it is dry, you should uh, prune it off. So hot and dry, cut it off like six inches below the dead area. And uh, try and also find it near a bud or a, where a shoot may be uh, developed. And that's about all you can do. Uh, there are some bacteria sides. Um, I don't like to recommend them for the homeowners because they're mo often misused, and then the back fire blight bacteria becomes resistant to them, and we don't have anything left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they might want to sterilize their. Yeah, oh yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. Sterilize right. with a bleach, 10% uh, bleach solution, or rubbing alcohol that you flame off the tool between every single cut. Yep. Is it more prevalent this year? We've had it, a lot of it questions. It just likes rainy weather. I've had oh. some, yeah, questions. Yeah. This and we've had okay. a wet spring, and so it's running wild. Mm -hmm. So we're happy for the wet, yeah. but then you get fire blight and weeds. Yeah. So <laughs> and and it, fire blight issues. really loves pear. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Joe, for that question and for your answer, too. Let's go to line two, then. It's another question about pear trees with Marlene. Hi, Marlene. Hi. How are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for taking my call. You're welcome. And I thought it was interesting that Joe had the same question almost, but mm -hmm. I noticed early this spring it looked like, I don't think it's a leader branch, but it's a branch that's the main part of the tree and pretty high up. And this is about a 40-foot tall tree, Cleveland pear. And that branch just looks completely dead for about three or four feet down. And then on the tree at different uh, places, random places, like the tips of the branches, the leaves are dying. Is that the same thing? Fire blight can kill an entire pear tree in one season, uh, but that's more likely in Michigan where they have wetter weather. Uh, but fire blight can be, and you can also have cankers, especially when it's being spotty like that where you're dying in the middle of the branches and instead of at the end down, I would suspect that you got cankers. The way you can check for cankers is take a knife, cut into the dead area, dead area into the green. And if under the dead area you have like a chocolate brown discoloration, uh, and then you go into the creamy white of the healthy tissue, the odds are you got a canker. And that, look, cankers are diseases of stress. So cold weather, drowning, drought, you name it, 
And we had a drought three years ago, and the canker should be popping up pretty good this year. And then the severely cold weather we had last winter mm -hmm. will increase that, too. Yeah, right. Yeah, didn't help. Okay. Done for it. Uh, uh, pruning is what you got, and you can also consider fertilizing in the fall, and you prune out all the dead. Okay, starting the show with two pair questions. <laughs> wow. Okay, thank you, Marlene. Appreciate it. Now, let's go to line three, and Sue has a question about a cherry tree. Hi, Sue. Hello. Um, I have a flowering cherry tree. I don't remember the particular uh, variety that it is right now, but I planted it about four years ago, and each year in the spring I get the little flowers, and it you know, does its beautiful thing. But with this past winter, it did not bloom flowers, and it did not come out with um, uh, the pretty growth like it usually does. And, uh, but now, it, with all this wet we've had, it seems to snap out of it, and it looks pretty good, except I notice some of the taller new shoots coming at the top of the tree have, like, bare areas, but at the very end, I've got all this leaf growth. And I got to looking at it this evening real close, and I noticed I got millions of these tiny red ants running up and down the tree trunk and all the branches. And I did notice one leaf had like insect bites on it, but none of the other leaves seemed to be affected. So I don't know uh, at the why, I guess, I don't know how to explain the why in the branches, you know, where it branches out the, the bottom like a V. Uh, there's like a, a sticky substance, a brownish substance of some sort. And I don't know if I'm getting in some kind of disease that's attracting the ants to it or what, but I've never noticed them there before. Well, uh, I'm going to let some of it maybe mean, how long has this tree been in the ground? It's been in four years. You may have some problems with how it was planted uh, because this sounds like you're in a problem. And the bleeding at the crotch may be one of Phil's uh, bores. Yeah, that sounds like. Uh, or an insect and problem. I, and I wonder, too, if the, the cold temperatures might have affect the flowering. Yeah, so well, they, part yeah of definitely the, the cold yeah. weather got the flowers. Yeah, but, but beyond the that, dying it sounds like area some other issues, too. Sounds like it's a, a planting and, you know, stress plant, uh, due to planting. And um, the drought we had three years ago and all that. So, yeah, you're going to need to water during the droughts whenever we get a drought this year. Water every 10 days. Uh, fertilize in the fall to rec uh, give us some fer uh, nutrients to get regrowth, and then you just keep all the dead pruned out. And anything about the ants is up to fill. Yeah. Uh, yeah, flowering <coughs> cherries are marginally hardy in the northern half of Illinois, um, and so uh, and so particularly depending if uh, if you're even even in, in in central Illinois if you're if you're out in the country. We had one that it took about five years to die and it just died a little bit each year. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, certainly the flowers would have been due to the cold weather, and I would suspect that what the ants are being attracted to are that you probably have some cankers on there that are bleeding, and they're producing sweet material either mm -hmm. from, the funga, from, a, from the bacteria and fungus that's in there, or actually just the sap itself, and that's probably what the ants are attracted to more than that. Uh, many times at the crotches you're going to get cankers on flowering cherries that are going to bleed and, that, and the ants will be attracted to that bleeding associated with it. So the ants are, are, are coming to the problem that the plant has, has initially and it's, uh, it's really difficult to keep a, keep a flowering uh, cherry alive very long, particularly when we've had a winter like we had last winter. Okay, so not the greatest news, yeah. but nope. <clears throat> a lot of factors. Lots going on there. Thanks so much then. Let's go now to a special Did You Know? quite harvesting onions yet, but you can be prepared. Although refrigerating onions sometimes helps them, so not so qu not quite so bad. Well, let's go to some emails, and I'll throw it back over to you, Jim. Okay, I have one where they have these mushrooms, and actually it's a shelf fungus growing on the side of the tree, and uh, they want to know if they can eat them. Uh, <coughs> first of all, the shelf fungus tells you that your tree is rotting and eventually will probably fall down. How soon? I don't know. But I personally do not recommend eating wild mushrooms or uh, shelf fungi in that. I'm not an expert in it. 
if you want to check for safety, you find a really old mushroom hunter, you know, and they have, <laughs> them, <t> <laughs> uh -huh. and they have them teach you what it takes to find the healthy one. Because I want to point out to you, for everyone that's edible, there's a m one that will mimic it that will either make you very sick or kill you. So I really don't like s telling people by pictures that's an edible mushroom or shelf fungus or not. So uh, find somebody that has done this for a long, long time and has a very good safety record. <laughs> Have them and taste it first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. And next to you, Candace. Okay, um, I have a question here from a gentleman from Champaign who has an American sweet gum tree in his yard, um, about 60 years old. He said this year it's leafing out really late. It's really sparse in the foliage. So he's wondering if this is from the winter. Is this is this normal? What's what's happening? And more than likely, yes. This was from uh, the really cold winters we had. Um, American sweet gum is a Zone Five B plant, so it is kind of marginally hardy here. It's kind of on the uh, on the edge. So there's some of those like that and tulip tree uh, red buds were pretty late this year. Uh, and he noted that they were all similar in his neighborhood. So that that kind of lets you know that yep, it was. It was a cold weather issue, so should jump. It should be out of it fine by now, and next year it'll be um, fine too. So, we have a like lot that. of tree questions today. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And now I bet you don't have a tree question, Phil. You're next. <laughs> I'm just I have guessing. Something that kind of looks like a tree. Okay. <laughs> uh, Westway Office of Springfield, Illinois, says that he has some asparagus beetles, and they either attack the spindly stalks or they cause the stalk to be that way. Should I burn the affected stalks to destroy the eggs, or will cutting the affected stalks eliminate the eggs? Well, the asparagus beetle comes out very early in the spring as, as a beetle, which will lay its eggs on the spears coming up uh, from, the, from the soil. And generally, as good gardeners, what we do is we cut off the damaged part and we eat the rest. We would never do that in a store, but we do it out of our own garden. Uh, so, uh, so that's what would be recommended there. We don't recommend spraying the stalks at all or anything of that nature because the waiting period would be too long. Your stalk would be unedible by the time you could eat it. Uh, they will go ahead and lay eggs on the ferns and, and feed on the ferns as larvae. The larvae look like uh, little black slimy things uh, about up to about a quarter of an inch long. Beetles are very brightly colored, about the same size. And they will feed on the ferns. And if, if, a, if you allow them to eat a lot of the ferns away, that will result in reduced food for the plant and spindly stalks. But generally, the spindly stalks are due to lack of fertilizer. Uh, asparagus is a pretty heavy feeder, and you need to, need to fertilize it well. Uh, you can spray the, uh, the ferns to keep the, uh, keep the beetles off with either carbaryl sold as seven or spinosad, and, uh, and Bonide makes a product called Bullseye that has that. Spinosad is an organic product. Uh, seven's about the same toxicity. Uh, but do not spray the spears. Just go ahead and cut off the bad parts or the eggs and go on. And, and you were talking about the skinny ones maybe doing the insects. Also, male spears are smaller or thinner than the females, and there's a lot more males t compared to the female stalks. So you might just want to be careful about <laughs> what, what is happening. It does Depending have on the variety, my understanding oh. is that there are male-only varieties that yeah. are bigger stalks. Oh, okay. So it mm -hmm. depends on the variety of spirits, okay. I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so still some asparagus questions. Okay. Thank you, viewers. And let's go to the phone lines. Let's start with line six with Al, and I think it's an iris question. Hi, Al. Yeah, I have a bed of iris that have probably been blooming 20 years, and this year they came out pure white. And I have two friends that have had the same experience, and I was wondering what to expect next year. Will they be purple or white, or will they be dead? Oh, <laughs> yes. so they, <laughs> wow, we cannot lose on that answer. Yes. So they were purple, and now they're this white. This year they're white. Right. Hmm. hmm. Mutation? That was, that's what, yeah. about the only thing it could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah plant genetics are very strange. Yeah. They, can, they can mutate and survive much easier than, than, pe than people or animals can do. So. Uh, very likely you've had a, had a mutation, and it depends what part of a corm is survived and so on that will come up as to whether you're going to have, going to have purple iris or, or white iris will have a lot to do with that. Uh, so, uh, you know, many times 
uh, we get a uh, we get a mutation and, and it's over for us with with plants they make a different kind of plant when that happens so their genetics is really kind of flimsy and strange compared to that of, of animals and so it's probably that sort of thing plants will mutate commonly and it could have been from any variety of things just uh, anywhere from age down to weather or or physical injury or anything else that could cause the genetics to go a little haywire it'll be interesting to see how many end up being yeah. mm -hmm. purple mm -hmm. versus white. Could be a mix white. next year too. It could, it be. could be. Oh yeah. So, well, you'll have to report back. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much, Al. And now on to Tom's questions about peony, and it's line four. Hi, Tom. Hi, I just wanted, I, I had a quick question. Um, some people call them pennies, some people call them peonies. Um, this year they didn't really get as big as what they usually do, but when do I actually, after they bloom out, when do I actually cut the seed part of it out, or do I drop it on the ground, or should I just leave it go? Okay, Candace. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Um, once they're done flowering, you could uh, definitely just prune out those, those seed pods. Uh, most of the time, they're not going to root for you, so the plant kind of wastes its energy on the producing the seed. So you're better off kind of pruning those out, letting the plant focus on making more foliage and making more roots, and then next year, hopefully, you'll have a better, um, better comeback from the peonies. Yeah. And probably the most important part is you do not mow them off. Yes, let the foliage go. Yeah, they, they need to get that energy stored back into the root system in order to survive for the next year. So. When I was growing up, my father allowed me to mow them off when the <laughs> leaves were falling off the trees in the fall. There you oh, go. is that right? Mm -hmm. That's a good oh. time to do it. Yep. Very there well done. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just simply cut them with sh shears by then, but it's much yeah. more fun to mow them. Much fun to mow them. Yeah, you mowed sure. around them all summer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good question about peonies. Now let's go to a weed question, and this is line five with John. Hi there. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Just a question about weeds and grass that grow in the cracks of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And a neighbor told me that instead of buying like a herbicide, she said just dissolve salt water into salt into your water in your sprayer, spray it in the cracks, and that'll kill the live ones and prevent new ones. Is that would that work? And uh, would it be harmful to the sidewalk? Do you think the concrete? And I have another question. Do you have plants then just? to each side of your sidewalk? No, this is just the regular sidewalk that goes parallel to the street. You know how they have okay. joints that are pre-made in them and then sometimes mm -hmm. they get other cracks and then dirt, little fine dirt from the rains gets in there. Okay. And then that, in that dirt grows a little line of weed. Yes, okay. Well, panelists, <laughs> what do you think? Well, first of all, it's not a legal recommendation. No. Uh, because you're using uh, salt that's not Ha doesn't have a pesticide label, but it does kill. And the important thing is, is the salt moves with the water. Yeah. And if you've ever been out and seen the Bonneville salt flats, you can understand how if you put enough salt there, you will not have any plants in your yard. Yeah, and, and the salt, <laughs> yeah. And the salt, and the yeah. salt ruins the soil. Ruins the soil. You are ruining the soil. <clears throat> it is not a good thing to do. That's why I asked, is there anything Nearby. on either yeah. side? Because yeah. <laughs> that, you know, over time, that would build up. Mm -hmm. And in the greenhouse, you would just have to leach, you know, pour water through mm -hmm. when yeah. you get a high salt buildup. And yeah. things just, a lot of times we would replace the soil. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, hard to do. Yeah, so, yes, it yeah. will kill, but it will build up and kill permanently. Well, all you have to do is look along the road where they salt the streets, and you see all your dead grass on, on the mm -hmm. corners and all that. When it's, and that moves too and with rain and that, so yeah. Yes. Okay, so thank you for your question about weeds. We're going to go to another question on line one, and Mary has an elderberry question. Hi there. Mary? Hi. I'm curious about a couple of elderberry shrubs. Uh, I've observed wilting leaves on them on a few branches. What can you tell me about that? There is a borer that will get into them. It's a beetle borer that will tunnel into the stem of elderberry. And, uh, and uh, so it could be the possibility of a reason for it. Uh, you, can, you can cut those off uh, the part there and split the stem and see if there is a white larva in there. And the control for it is to, is to prune off those particular stems that are, 
that are dying back associated with it. There, we don't recommend any uh, insecticide control. Usually elderberries grow fast enough and strong enough that once you prune that off and destroy the larva in there, not only do you reduce the number for next year, but the, but the bush will come back in good shape. They are tough. Yeah, yeah they'll mm -hmm. grow like crazy. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to cut that and just put it down. Yeah, you don't want to just drop it on the ground. The larva might be old enough to pupate and come out as beetles and, and still continue to attack your bush. So, but I haven't seen that this year. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. So, and you really can't kill elderberry. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested. I, I just, if I see it, I don't want to see it in my own yard. Yeah. <laughs> let's see, let's see about that. Wow, doesn't the show go fast? We had lots of trees questions and really a lot of insect disease questions. So, um, I think we're seeing a little bit of cold weather and wet spring yep. mm -hmm. evidence from your questions. We want to thank you for being the best viewers. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you for your expertise to the You're three welcome. of you. We appreciate it. Hope you have a great week gardening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>